Um, headed to Abby Johnson's house. She is a, a former abortion clinic worker. She was a director at Planned Parenthood and had a profound conversion. 70% of people that work inside of, of the abortion industry have had abortions themselves. Oh, wow. So they need healing too, right? I mean, just like the women coming out that have just had abortions, they need that healing. But they are, they are dealing with something that is so powerful. They need so much healing. They need so much recovery. They need more compassion. The chaos of having five little kids is like crazy to me. And they're always yelling. Someone's always, why is someone always yelling in this house? I don't understand it. First thing in the morning, you put them on the pot. When they get up from the nap, you put them on the pot. Well, how do you get them to stay on the pot? I mean, they, well, they she just... does, she does. Really? I am up early, headed to the Vitae clinic. Any trouble with breathing at all? Um, you're not short of breath now? We're pregnant. Already a little chaotic with five. Not sure what we were thinking here. I was profoundly grateful that we did sure. have that feeling of like, what have we gotten ourselves into? Uh -huh. The Christian life is always the way of the cross. And the cross does mean sacrifices. And it does mean that you're gonna feel some pain sometime. But the cross is also the way to joy. Our first was a boy, and then we had four girls in a row. So with this baby number six, we were, you know, thinking it would maybe be nice to get a little change, and we found out that it is a boy, so we are very, very excited. It's been eight years since we had a boy, and uh, the whole family's thrilled. My name is Jennifer Fulweiler. I'm a writer, and I'm an atheist to Catholic convert. Um, hey, let, let me fix my coffee and then I'll pick you up, okay? Sip of coffee before we begin. So first day of religious ed was day before yesterday, and we're halfway there, and our five-year-old mentions in passing that she has no shoes. She had on shoes at one point. Somehow they got taken off between when I said put on shoes and, um, and, and then when we got in the car, and so I called Joe um, and used, used some extremely forceful terms to explain that I wanted a new family policy of having five backup pairs of shoes in the car at all times. And Joe had only bad solutions for me. Um, what, what was it you suggested? Like, you asked if I had a paper? Well, the first thing I said was, this has happened before, right? <laughs> well, well, right, yeah, because, well, I had and said... And it worked out okay the last well, time. Well, you asked if they would let us in, and I said, well, I know yeah. they'll let us in because this happened, like, three weeks ago, so... Yeah. So problem solved, <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? <laughs> do, right. do whatever you did last solved, time. right, yeah, you know? so... Right, yeah, our, our kids have no shoes, no problem. <laughs> So yeah, but w I, I did also suggest that we have a bucket, a little trash bucket that we keep in the car. You can put that on one foot. You can wrap when the, the other oh, and rollerblades. Oh yeah, we have rollerblades roller that we could like. No, we have child size rollerblades. No, but for like a big kid. Yeah, but you had a big kid with you. You could put Don on rollerblades, <laughs> take his shoes off, and put so them he on has to, he has to rollerblade in the class yeah. because it's and Lucy will walk in with like shoes. big shoes, yeah. right? Big boy shoes. You were asking so. for ideas, you know. I'm, I'm giving you solutions. <laughs> These, Pick the yeah. best one. You know? <laughs> no, those 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 were. I, I was asking for good solutions. Yeah, well, <laughs> the good solution is don't put the shoes. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, seven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yaya is my mother-in-law, and she's more of a force of nature than, than a regular human being. Uncle John, Joey's uncle, he killed a rattlesnake on his property yesterday. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? Yeah, because he's out in the country. <laughs> well, I didn't know that's crazy. Like, our kids play out there, and they're like, mm -hmm. rattlesnakes? Well, so did, uh, so did John and Joey and Joe, and Joey was a baby. I got, Pictures of Joey out there when he was 18 months old. Wow. Um, have you ever seen a rattlesnake? Yes. Really? Like, like not at a zoo? Right. Because I'm from the country. <laughs> they have snakes in the country. Like, but rattlesnakes? Right. Yeah. Wow. And what? I, 
did you did you kill it or did you run away? I probably ran away. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I don't remember killing a snake. But yeah, but it's it, this it's very common. It especially appears more common than where we are because it's so dry and hot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm 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 really surprised y'all don't have rattle snakes around here. We don't know that we don't. What is what is this? Like they're, they're rattlesnakes and like scorpions and like it's, we all have heat stroke and it's like 105 degrees and I, I sometimes I wonder like why did we stay? I mean I love this place but you know I, I I think most actually maybe all of my Texas relatives have not only been stung by scorpions but stung at night in bed by scorpions. I'm in the kitchen and Joe's like. Have you looked in the washer? And I said, well, why? 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 Why would I have looked in the washer? And he said, oh, no reason, no reason. And I knew, I, I was like, oh, it's a scorpion, it's a scorpion. So I start freaking out immediately. I knew, there's only one thing he could have meant by that statement. Sure enough, I flip open the lid. It's empty, but there is a dead, if not very clean scorpion at the bottom of it. What had we been washing in there? I'm thinking like, oh, did we drag in some burlap rags from out in the yard and like that's what had been in the washer? No, it clicked. We had just washed our bed sheets. The clock is ticking. It is only a matter of time until I wake up to a scorpion in my bed repeatedly stinging me while I sleep. The, the thing about snakes and things like that, that's when you have chickens and dogs and things that, that keep... Can chickens kill rattlesnakes? No, but it scares them away. Oh. It keeps them away. The more active, they like to slither in into nice, quiet places. Well, we need chickens, then. Uh, with the kids you've got. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The kids will scare them away. <laughs> One time when Yaya was staying in our house, she was going on and on on the phone with somebody and yelling at them about politics and like, you know, well, you're going to have to answer to God for your vote and like, well, well, I don't care, you know, I don't want to hear it. Like, that's not even an excuse. And so I'm putting groceries away or whatever and this goes on and on. And finally, she gets off the phone and I said, who was that? And she was like, this is the wrong number. <laughs> She grew up poor in, in East Texas and is a tough-as-nails woman who worked her way out of poverty. And she's the type of person who would give anyone in need the, the shirt off her back if they needed it. Um, she raised my husband as a single mother and very much felt this sense that she had to fight for everything. She, she lived in a neighborhood that was a little rough at times. And you know, starting when she was a child, she had to fight for everything she's ever had. And, and so that has really carried over into her personality and she is just a tough talking, you know, fighting Texas woman. I have no idea. Oh, and also sometimes people will call her and like hang up, you know, like and, and once and that always drove her crazy. But then when like uh caller ID came in, she started calling people back. You know, and like I misdialed your number by accident wasn't a good enough answer, you know. It was like who were you trying to call? You know, what is their number? I don't know if I believe you. Like, you know, you never know what's going to happen when you're around Yaya, but um, it's always fun, and uh, she she definitely keeps life interesting for us. Our three-year-old very much would rather live at Yaya's house than ours. She's kind of our feral child. Yeah. I killed that Oh, you kill bad animals? Well, how do you kill them, Kate? I stomp on them. Well, it, I don't know if that's what St. Francis would do. I mean, may, maybe we maybe we shouldn't kill bad animals. Give me that pass. That is so ridiculous. Oh, come here. She just wants to, like, run naked through the woods with the animals and, like, eat off the floor. You are three years old. You do not need a pass. Um, okay. So, anyway, maybe we shouldn't kill bad animals, Kate. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> but you like good animals. You win, Kate. So she loves being at Yaya's house. Do you think you'll learn about Jesus in school today? I never do. Oh, well, it, it's a church school, so I, I think they do learn about it sometimes. Do, who's Jesus' is mommy? Kate, I think you do talk about Jesus in your school because you go to the, our church school.
Well, I don't. Well, what do you talk about then? Nothing. And nothing? You don't do anything all day long? Mm -hmm. The other day she was pretending to be on the phone at our house, but she's she had obviously picked up a lot from Yaya's house. And so she picks up this toy phone and says, hello. And then she said, you keep your cats out of my yard. They're not my cats. They're your cats. You keep your cats out of my yard. <laughs> and so I was pretty sure I knew where she got that. Ted Weinstein is my literary agent. He actually found me a long time ago when I, I had a secular site. I was an atheist and I was writing stuff and, and he found me through that. And he was the one who said, let's turn this into a memoir. So that was back in 2008. And he's been with me the whole way and I have learned so much from him. The issue is primarily what detail you're highlighting. Okay. This book that people will finally see, it's not my first book, it's like my fourth book. It just so happens that I've rewritten the same story four times. I think he's kind of taking a chance on this one because it's definitely not the kind of thing he normally represents. Because the second half <laughs> is where it gets re really religious, really Catholic. He suggested that I have a people with a variety of backgrounds read it and give me feedback. and. They did have a variety of feedback. Some of it stung, frankly, you know, and they would tell me that parts that I thought were hilarious were not funny. <laughs> you know, things that I thought were brilliant were actually kind of boring. The feedback in the past has been like rewriting entire, you know, 150 page sections of the book. I, I will say that it is like 10,000% better than the first draft that I sent Ted. And the last time I read it, I, it, it was just, I, I have worked on this so long. I mean, I was like, I, 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 can, I can quote entire chapters from memory. But one thing that every single one of them said is that they couldn't put it down. Four to five years of intense work, not only for me, but for our whole family. Everything I've studied, everything I've learned, the stack of books this high that I've read to learn how to be a better writer, the edits I've gone through. I've had seven different people read it, innumerable revisions. I think this book is making me slightly insane. You know, I've told Ted that this is my final offer, that I'm not, I, I just can't rewrite it again. Uh, the big call with Ted is tomorrow. Oh, good. And um, if Ted doesn't represent it, uh, I'll, I'll probably cry. I'd really be pretty crushed. I really want him to represent this book. So we're here at Guerra's, we have spent so much time in this place and spent so much money in this place. Honestly, a lot of times when we go out for date night, I just, I kind of want to like bring a pillow and just... <laughs> Joe has pointed out that there's, I have this, it's not exactly a split personality. Joe calls him subconscious Ted and I walk around having arguments with my subconscious agent. Because Ted's going to hate it. Mm -hmm. He's going to hate it. And he's going to probably hate me by extension. I'm gonna be put on a blacklist. Well, I thought that chapter was good, and I know you think it's too long, but I had to make it that long, because I, I had to explain the backstory, and you can't have that chapter without backstory. But well, we're talking about Ted Weinstein. Every one of his clients, he pushes to make their work better. You know? I agree. So, you know, he's just, he's just good. Joe and I dated for two years before we got engaged. We had a great relationship, had a lot of fun. We both um, were working on starting a business together. We knew that that's something that we always wanted to do. And so he actually caught me off guard. It was two days after Valentine's Day. We were in San Francisco and we walked out to the center of the Golden Gate Bridge and he had gotten an heirloom diamond that belonged to my great grandfather who came over from England. And so Joe had had that diamond with the ring and he asked me to marry him in the center of the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> he is a realist without being a pessimist. Like he can, he can always find, he always can make me feel better about any problem without being unrealistic about it either. Just saying, you know, well, let's look at it from this angle and, and it ends up being a, a positive angle. And, um, you know, he's, he's just really my rock in that sense. You know, whenever I feel overwhelmed with something, I, I just don't know what I would do without his advice. We have a lot of grandparent support. We need to convince the grandparents instead of keeping the kids so we can go out, they should take the kids somewhere else and let us stay in our own house. Let we, us sleep. We really like our house, you know? And like we can sleep or watch TV, we can do whatever. Like we like to be in our house. And yeah, it's kind of tiring 
to go out sometimes. Yeah, it's definitely definitely a different phase of life than when we would close down Guerrero's and Every know, night. spend absurd amounts of money. We used to joke that this was like our kitchen or our living room. I mean, we, we were literally here like five days a week. One year I got my Amex bill and it showed all of my annual expenditures for the previous year and we had spent over thousand dollars just in this restaurant in one year. So if you that, see a t like a golden table, like the full Weiler Memorial <laughs> table, that's why. Well, the crazy thing is, I mean, I don't think we even stood out. I think they have a lot of regulars. Excuse me, guys. We lock our doors in 10 minutes. Oh, okay. oh, okay. okay. No problem. Um, should we keep going? <laughs> Um, wait till I need to make a phone call real quick. Um, uh, so let me do that, and then um, and, and then let's do ballet clothes, okay, sweetie? Okay. Hi, Victoria. I don't know if I've said hi to you yet today. <laughs> yeah. We're very anxious to get ballet clothes on. Well, um, okay. Uh, as soon as. Um, as soon as possible. Wait, do you want to maybe just stay home from dance class today? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't think so. What? I want to do <laughs> okay. Um, Victoria, after I step out for this thing, um, you can go ahead and help her get dressed. I, I want I want to wait until my call starts. But um, her dance class stuff. If you go up to my bedroom, do you remember that the the round dresser that baby stuff used to be in. Lucy's dance class stuff is on top of it. It's like in a little pile of like the clothes that were last week. Are you juking and jiving? So what do you think you're going to do in dance class today? Um, oh yeah. If you do want to, we can go buy a West Coast. Oh, we could buy a restaurant with, oh, uh, okay. Lucy, this is a radio interview. I'll get you snacks in 10 minutes. Hello. Hi, Jennifer. Yes, hey, Cassie. How are you? Good, good. How's it going? Good. Can you get my email about kind of the topic? Yeah, I love that. And so, so you'll be referencing that, that post I wrote, right? Correct, yes. I'll put you on hold and you'll be shortly, okay? Okay, great. Thanks. It is very hot in this garage. And there's a wasp. Um. All right, it is 17 minutes after the hour. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. It is good to be with you here today. Let me welcome to the broadcast uh, Jennifer Fallweiler. Jennifer, good afternoon. Thanks, Drew. Always so great to be here. I, I love uh, love your story, of course. And you and I have talked about atheism in the past. We've talked about Catholic evangelization. I came across one of your articles recently on how you believe the internet will be a powerful tool in bringing about. Uh, conversion to Christianity. Give me your take on why that is. I, you know, I'm kind of on the fence on this. I can see its potential, <laughs> but uh, I've got my own theory. <laughs> Drew, don't tell me that you've occasionally seen seen some things that are less than inspiring from Catholics on the internet. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, you know, I, I think that what inspired me to write that post was it was really a very personal post for me because my conversion was very much influenced by the internet. I, you know, there's one thing about being a loudmouth atheist for, you know, all your life is that you don't tend to have a lot of Christian friends. And so when I first came to this amazing conclusion that maybe there's something to this Jesus Christ guy, you know, I, I had a lot of questions, but I did not know any practicing Christians. And so I looked around and thought, you know, what am I going to do about this? And so I thought, maybe there's some Christians on the internet. <laughs> and so I started a blog. I started reading Christian blogs and blogging and, and the Catholics who were out there on the internet were absolutely key to not only my conversion, but my husband's conversion. So the internet helped change your worldview from atheist to Christianity? It did. And, and because of those reasons that I was talking about in the post, which is, you know, for example, Let's say back when I was in college, this was right at the cusp of the internet era. We weren't really online. Let's say somebody threw out something like, there's no historical evidence that, that a person named Jesus even existed. Everyone would just kind of nod and, and accept that as fact. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds true. 
Well now, imagine saying that on a blog. If even one Christian comes across that post, you know, blogs have a comments form. And so they can leave a comment saying, um, actually, that's not true at all. And, you know, here are five links that you can read to, to books and other resources to, to see that that is simply a false statement. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, my position on the Internet has always been this, that it's inherently neutral. It's kind of the position of the church that uh, if it is used for good, then goods can be multiplied. If it's used for evil, evils will be multiplied. It's how we right. use this particular medium. So I think that we can, you know, not, obviously I think we should always be concerned about the I immoral stuff that's out there, but I think that we should also not let that discourage us from saying, you know, we, we really have a duty, I think, to, to be online and to be using this medium and to be doing as much good as we possibly can. No, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the other factor outside of our, you know, propensity or, or, or you know, uh, our tendency towards sin. On the other side of that is the Holy Spirit. And you're right, so often it often takes just one simple invitation, one simple you know, kernel of truth to forever change someone's direction. I think the internet certainly has that power. To put it bluntly, I think that we Catholics have got to try harder. I think frankly in everything we do, in the movies we create, in the books that we write, in the blog posts we write, I think I do think that there's a hunger for quality content, and I think that if we begin putting out top quality content, I do think we will get more attention and, and more people reading our stuff than, than maybe do now. But I think we also need to you know, make peace with the fact that this is a story as, as old as the world, that if you say something nasty and gossipy and uncharitable, it is always going to get a hundred times more exposure than you know than, than saying something um, you know truth truthful and 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 God centered. But as we were talking about earlier, the Holy Spirit only needs one person to read it once to change the world. When I look at Catholic television and radio, in a lot of respects, we're behind the curve, uh, be, behind our secular counterparts, and even behind some of our Protestant brothers and sisters. Where are we in terms of the Internet? Is it an even, even playing field right now? Are we a little bit behind? Are we ahead of the curve? Where are we? I think we have been very behind the curve, frankly. But I was just at the Catholic New Media Conference in Dallas last week, and the energy there was explosive, and it was packed, and there were a lot of people there. And, and, and we were getting together in small groups and someone was saying, you know, look at this app I designed, you know, look at this program I wrote. So there's a lot of energy and I'm seeing a lot of improvements and I have high hopes that we're gonna take over the online world. Well, check out Jennifer's article. I posted it at facebook.com. Great place for social media, right? Why the internet will lead to mass conversions to Christianity. You can check her out as well at conversiondiary.com. I'm Drew Mariani, back with more right after this. Okay, all right, God bless you, take care, bye. Oh my gosh, I did not know how hot it was in here. <laughs> oh, hi Lucy, oh, you're dressed for dance class. Joe and I first encountered Noe when we were actually in RCIA before we were officially Catholic. I wrote this memoir thing about my whole, you know, journey to Catholicism, and as I was writing it, I, I don't think I had realized just how much you impacted us in your RCIA class. And we see this, you know, really solid Catholic man walk in, and we, we'd heard about him, you know, that he'd spent decades as a missionary pouring out his life for the Lord. And so he stands up there and says that he's going to tell us about his conversion story, that he fell away from the Lord for a while. And Joe and I are like, ah, fell away from the Lord. Like, oh, what does he know about that? And tell him our story. I've tried to tell other people the story, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have it right. So you, you didn't just do heroin. You were, you were a dealer, right? Yeah, I was, I, was a, I was dealing drugs. I had connections from Mazatlan, Sinaloa, all the way to Chicago, Dallas. So uh, it was a whole, the whole route. Then he gets up there and says, I was a heroin addict and a heroin dealer. By God's grace, I, I got in trouble. Yeah, I got in trouble with the law, and I got in trouble with the other dealers. And Ooh, that's bad. That, 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 yeah, that was an uh, open contract.
in and out of jail, involved in every horrible street activity, and and showing up like, oh, okay, so fell away from the Lord indeed. So my uncle uh, took me to a place. It was called Pulpit in the Shadows. Pulpit in the Shadows. Yeah, it's like a halfway house for for addicts and people just coming out of prison. I, I, I like the shadows part because I thought, man, this is a good place to hide. <laughs> but, but, but I didn't, I, the pulpit, I didn't get it. But I wound up back in my mom and dad's house and I'm, I'm withdrawing cold turkey. And one day out of the blue, just I just get up from bed, put on my boots and walk the block to church. And. In my mind, I'm thinking, I think I can talk this priest into letting me have 15 bucks for, for half a gram. You know? Noe has an incredible conversion story. And Father O'Malley answered, and he said, come on in. What's your name, Noe? Noe, come on in. He took me to his office, and instead of talking, I started going to confession. Wow, you just told him. I told him, I'm, I'm a heroin addict. I've stolen, I've killed, I've done, I've done, I've done. He got up from his chair and went around his desk and came and got in my face. And, and uh, he said, Noe, I'm not gonna tell you that Jesus has all your answers. Like the hippie did. He said, he's your only answer. He said, come tonight at 7 p.m. at the church. We meet from 7 to 10, three hours, three, <laughs> three messages consecutive, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and he read, he could read my mind that I was saying three hours is too long. Yeah. I didn't say it, but yeah, I thought yeah. it. He said, now I know three hours is too long, probably, so just come and put a chair by the door. And if you don't feel, you feel sick, go out and then come back. Look. If you come and you don't like it, just split. Wow. He said, but no, at least give Jesus a chance because this is your only chance. So that night, around six o'clock, I don't know how I did it, but I scored a half a gram and I fixed. So I could, you know, be normal. To go to the prayer meeting? Yeah. Wow. So I, I came. And I sat by the door, and that night, Jesus made himself real to me. He penetrated that drug, touched my heart, and uh, the people prayed for me, and I felt something in me stir, you know, and my faith grew. I thought, it is possible that, that I can get help. My, my, my dad and mom and uncles came and supported me, and, and I, they rented a room away from, from the house in another town so I could go withdraw. The room only had one door to come in, open to the inside. My dad went and laid down across that door in case I got up and wanted to run away. I had an encounter uh, with, with God the Father and telling me that he loved me, that I was his son. Then he said, but look, Think about me. I've never been unfair to you. I haven't made any mistakes. I love you a million times more than that guy. Because I'm your dad. I'm your real dad. See, I'm adopted. So I knew what he's talking about. And uh, I fell asleep crying. And, and the next morning, I was healed. I, I didn't need heroin anymore. And no more withdrawal? No, no more withdrawal. And did you ever relapse after that? No. No, that Just was from it. that day on? Here. Yeah, from that day on. Jesus has solved the sin problem. He can give me new life if I just submit to him and repent. And he'll fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to live a new life. Uh, I started doing missions and conferences and, and retreats and 
you know, all this stuff, because I was free. And so, and, and I think you said in RCIA that you feel like that's your, your mission to, to tell people that, you know, Jesus isn't just someone we read about in books and who we, you know, say, oh, I, I read that and that's reasonable. And I, I, I think that the story of Jesus might be true, that, that he's a real person mm -hmm. and he changes lives. Mm -hmm. We listened to this profound story about how through the sheer grace of God, he was cured of his addiction and brought back to faith. And by the end of it, both Joe and I, and it was saying something because Joe never got teary eyed about anything. We, we were both like wiping tears out of our eyes. We, we were amazed. That's the part of the recipient. The recipient needs to somehow encounter, and every parent should have this, a vehicle where you present the core gospel message to people. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit will bring the people there yeah. because yeah. people are hungering. That, I mean, it, it doesn't take uh, a philosopher <laughs> or a, a, you know, a, a genius to figure out that something's not right, yeah. something's missing. I think everybody can identify with being still just before you go to sleep and thinking, is this it? <laughs> you know, is, yeah. is, is this it? Yeah. You know, because we, we're all built with that hunger, that need for the Lord, for God. And, and, and you know, that's the way he created us in submission likeness. And so uh, uh, if every parish had that vehicle, the Holy Spirit would bring these hungry people there and they would hear it and God loves me that you know we, we are sinners and our sin separates us from that love so he can't affect us and that in Jesus God became a man fully man fully fully God to solve that problem to bring us back to that relationship well I, I, I think of your story all the time when I, I definitely have a tendency to make the faith intellectual like Jesus is a reading project. <laughs> you know, Jesus is we still use your list for recommended <laughs> readers. <laughs> list. I need to get you a new one. Yeah, and then no, we have Joe it, I, th I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah, I think it's yeah. both. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, so. but, but yeah, I think I think it's easy to to go too much in the extreme of the the reading and the books. And I a lot of times I think of of, of your story and you know you shared it with us in in our CIA and I'll never forget you said you know my mission is to tell people that Jesus Christ is real and he does change lives. And, and I've, I've never forgotten that, thanks to you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Noe. I know you're so busy with just everything you have going on, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and it's my pleasure. Thank you so okay. much. Today's the big day. Um, I am going to find out whether whether my agent is, after five years of work and revisions, whether my agent is going to represent this book um, or whether I need to start over and figure out some kind of plan B. So um, I think I have been worrying about this call, lying awake at night thinking about it probably for about five or six months now. So um, this is really a big day. <laughs> the worst possible scenario is that is that Ted just doesn't think it's good because I think it's good and my readers think it's good and um, I just, I, I feel like I have done what I can do with this project, and so if it's not where he wants it to be, then I, I, don't, I, I don't think there's really anything more that I can even do, and um, so I guess that, that's the worst case scenario, that he, just, that he just wouldn't represent it. He's been with this project from the beginning, and I really trust his judgment, and I really trust his expertise, and I, I want him to continue to be a partner in this project. I never intended 
on selling this book alone and I don't want to start now after five years of hard work. And so um, if he's not going to represent it, then I, I'll probably have to just spend some time like sobbing uh, before I figure out what my plan B is. I'm actually about to get on the phone with my literary agent and have um, what could be a stressful phone call with him. So, um, oh yeah, she might try to take Kate to her house. Um, I, do you, since I'm, I am like, Ted is about to call in like 10 minutes. Do you mind calling Yaya? Oh no, wait, Kate doesn't have dance class. It's Lane and Lucy. So Kate can actually go to Yaya's if she wants to. Um, so, okay, so yeah, just I just need Lane and Lucy here to get ready for dance class. So just trying to organize babysitting for all five of the kids so that I can have this call. Um, you know, it'll be, it'll be tense enough without <laughs> five little kids running around underfoot. So I thought it would be good if, um, if, if the grandmothers could help out a little bit and uh, ha have the kids be at their places. Check time. I am, uh, I am really seriously nervous. Today is one of those days where I seriously uh, am honestly wondering how this is all going to get done. I feel totally overwhelmed. It's, it's just one thing after another, but um, you know, I, I know from experience it'll all work out and, and it's, it's fun. I mean, this is certainly a lot busier than back when, you know, it was just Joe and I in our condo in the Westgate. And um, so I think it'll be a good day, but um, I'm definitely gonna have to just <laughs> take deep breaths and take it uh, one thing at a time, because if I thought about it too much, I might, I might get really overwhelmed <laughs> by everything that's going on today. And um, speaking of which, um, five minutes <laughs> till Ted. Am I really ready for this? It's it's all anxiety all the time. <laughs> okay, this is it. Hey, Ted. How are you? Good, good. Well, let me ask a couple questions first. What do you? Why are you doing this? Because I think it's a good story, and I like to tell stories. But you. I've spent years on it because, you know, based on your advice, you have convinced me with all the other drafts that it would be a better story if I made changes. So, I mean, if it weren't for you, I probably would have like <laughs> tried to publish the first draft, which would have been embarrassing. Who are you writing this for? Uh, I guess I think of it as anyone who likes a good story. I don't know if you're giving yourself enough credit. Who, who do you think I'm writing it for? I mean, I well, don't... I mean, it's not just a story. In any story, you know, this isn't a bedtime story. Right. It's not a war story. I mean, there's all kinds of different stories with different purposes. Story is the category. Story is not what this is about. So when you're writing this and thinking about who's going to read it, who are you imagining? I guess first I imagine my blog readers. I mean, on a practical level, that, that's my platform. That's my readership. So, um, and how do you characterize them? Uh, mostly, mostly Catholic, but... Also, people who are not Catholic, who are, you know, seeking something transcendent, who have an interest in, like, spirituality. So, is this a book for Catholics, or is this a book for seekers? It's a book for seekers. Okay. The reason I ask is because there's been a bunch of people interested in you and the project and what this becomes in book form. And so we need to think that through from a commercial perspective as to who we offer this to. And so that's why I want to make sure I understand really clearly what your priorities are with this and who you're trying to reach. Um, it'll shape the last bit of polishing, and it will certainly shape who I pitch it to and how I pitch it. 
Okay, let's go through and talk through the sections. Uh, in a funny way, I think the beginning needs a little bit of work still. Yeah, okay. Once you get into the meat of the actual conversion experience, it's incredibly strong, and I had uh, a ridiculously small number of suggestions or concerns or thoughts. You know what's funny is that it's completely in line with um, with everyone. You know, I did the kind of like book group thing, and, and I was shocked that I'd get these long, long lists of feedback. 80% of it would be before the midpoint. I understand that you've been through a lot of drafts on this. I understand you're probably exhausted. <laughs> um, but as I told you way back when, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and you've come this far, and I don't have any doubts you can do the rest. When we're done with the conversation about the substance, we can talk about process. So let's hold that off and try not to worry about that for the moment, okay? Okay. And then jumping ahead, uh, election night, when you met or spent time with uh, Joe, too many adjectives and not enough points. Okay. Okay. It, okay. Yeah. But you got to trust the reader. Specificity is good, but sometimes there's gratuitous detail, which becomes a distraction. Right, right. Yep. You really want to make it real for the reader, but you do that already. But, okay. You know, let them concentrate on the core of the story and use their imagination for the atmosphere. Okay. Um, later in the book, you talk about eating some flan. You don't need to say the word the flan glistened. We've all okay. seen flan. <laughs> you know, that you're eating flan is fine. Okay. Don't bury me in adjectives because it reads a little bit too much like a women's magazine article. <laughs> okay. So, what this boils down to is, uh, I think it's great. I think we, you know, with one more light polish, we could start pitching it. I think, though, that your prospects for success, less with the smaller religious presses, but potential success with the um, major trade publishers. If I go back and I work on this and I can address these effectively, do you think then we would be, you know, pretty, pretty yeah, close? To... I don't think you should even look at the last half of the book. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good. Back from an editor, you know, if, if we get you matched with a really good editor, whatever the publishing. Company. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no, you're yeah, There's no reason to change that at all. It tells a great story. Great. Okay, so this could potentially be my last round of revisions, or not, not last. I mean, like a publisher would obviously have them, but you know, before um, before we get it ready to sell. I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, if I do it well. I am refuse to even talk about it. <laughs> okay. But we're getting close? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I just wanted to know that there was an end in sight. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, I am, I'm going to uh, incorporate this feedback and... Uh... You know, it's looking great. I mean, <laughs> you're making huge progress. You're writing this in a way that I think, you know, once you think through who you want to reach, could reach a, a broad audience, you're telling a good story. Um, the, the things that still need addressing are, you know, small writing things, not big picture, oh, are you telling a good story and are you telling it well? That's, that's all taken care of. Wow. All right. Well, that's very encouraging, actually. I mean, we've come a long way. <laughs> when I think back on that first draft, it's really, I'm, I'm kind of astounded at um, just the difference that, that I've seen in my own writing. and it, It's been exciting. All right. Thanks so much, Ted. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. I don't know how to hang this up. Okay. Yes, Kate. <laughs> I guess you could have a few marshmallows. <laughs> so it's back to marshmallow duty <laughs> immediately after my call. That's how it is. This is actually great news. His, I think I, um, I think he thought that I was maybe not willing to make any changes. I knew that he would have some feedback. I was okay with that. He, Ted seemed to think that I was going to be surprised by the amount of feedback he gave me like it would be too much. I, I actually, this is less than I thought. I mean, I think that I had fallen into a mentality 
that it was never going to be enough. That like it was yet again, it was going to be like fundamentally flawed book, problems in every single chapter, don't even know where to begin, you know, giving you the feedback. The feedback. But he read the whole thing. He even read, I mean, there are just some parts where they just get, it is like as politically incorrect as it could be. It's like crazy religious. And I really thought that he might call me today and say, um, you need to be arrested. Like, you're obviously a religious fanatic. <laughs> like, this is insane. And it's the second part of the book that, like, is really pretty intense with that kind of stuff. And he just told me that he didn't really have any feedback for that. I, I don't know that I've ever known Ted to, like, not have feedback on something I write. So um, this is this is good. This is actually, I, I think it's taking me a minute to process, like, that's really all he had to say that like, I used too many adjectives in the beginning, like get me the champagne. Like this is, um, I think we're gonna sell this book and my agent who is a top secular agent, he says that it can like break out of the Catholic market and like maybe reach other people. And like, I think I'm going to cry. Like that's, that is really, um, <laughs> Uh, I've just, I've been working on this for a really long time. It's, uh, I have not gotten a lot of good news in this project. It's only been like bad feedback, mistakes I've made, you know, places that I went wrong. And so this is really the first time I've, like, I've heard anyone else say that, like, this might, I might have actually done it and, like, this work might have actually been worth it. So it's been... It's been a long five years. <laughs> so I hear that someone in there needs some marshmallows. <laughs> so I guess I will go get them for her. <laughs>